वेलकम पी जी डी जी एम स्टूडेंट्स एंड द टॉपिक फॉर टूडे इज डायबिटीज मेलाइटिस इन एल्डरली आई वेलकम डॉक्टर सिन्हा हु इज प्रोफेसर ऑफ फॉर्मर प्रोफेसर ऑफ मेडिसिन इन सफदरजंग हॉस्पिटल हु वुड बी स्पीकिंग ऑफ ऑन डायबिटीज एंड आई ऑल्सो वेलकम डॉक्टर सीमा पुरी हु इज रीडर इन न्यूट्रिशन इन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ होम इकनॉमिक्स शी हैज़ डन अ लॉट ऑफ वर्क इन द एरिया ऑफ न्यूट्रिशन इन द एल्डरली पॉपुलेशन she has also been involved with our pgdgm program again from in during the development stage she has uh, helped us in the writing of the modules and is also involved in our counseling and our uh, evaluations strategies which have been formed i welcome you uh, dr seema puri she would be discussing upon uh, the nutritional aspect of diabetes mellitus now uh, in the elderly population the type 2 diabetes mellitus is common we all know that diabetes is a common metabolic disorder which is associated with a lot of morbidity and mortality in the geriatric age group now gradually india is becoming the diabetic capital of the world as has been predicted by who we all know that type 2 diabetes mellitus affects 10% of the elderly population above 65 and 40% of those above 80 years one of the main causes of this type 2 diabetes mellitus is insulin resistance i would now invite dr sinha to tell us about the causes of worsening insulin resistance in the elderly uh well as dr rochika rightly said the the incidence of diabetes is uh, rapidly going up and the who prediction of uh, that uh, every fifth person diabetic will be an indian by the year 2010 is very very close it's almost we are already in 2006 so a close watch on uh, this disease particularly diabetes as a metabolic disease is very important because you are, you know too well about diabetes in other age groups uh, the the morbidity associated as well as mortality associated with diabetes is unquestionable the important question which dr ruchika raised is uh, what are the causes of worsening insulin resistance well you are aware that type 2 diabetes mellitus is mostly because of rather almost always because of a, a insulin resistance and uh, this is the type of diabetes which we see in elderly not the type 1 type of diabetes because by the age this age you know type 1 diabetes uh, the outcome is uh, sometimes uh, very bleak so we we will be only concerned with type 2 diabetes in elderly yeah so and the causes of uh, worsening resistance in elderly is simple aging most important is the receptors age and there is resistance sedentary lifestyle is another important cause which contributes towards insulin resistance that's why you remember that exercise we have been emphasizing improves the insulin resistance insulin sensitivity in uh, diabetics weight gain sedentary habit loss of activity and normal diet leads to weight gain so all these three important factors aging lifestyle which is mostly sedentary adding weight are the common factors which lead to worsening insulin resistance now like uh, we discussed earlier that there are different uh, unique features in uh, thyroid disease uh, what are the unique features about diabetes mellitus in the elderly well diabetes may not present with classical symptoms and this happens due to physiological changes which are associated with aging and uh, therefore we we must consider the most important impairment that is cognitive impairment in this age group falls trauma injuries you know and impaired physiological functions besides the standard microvascular and microvascular complications before we institute the the treatment these are some important aspects which one should have covered so as regards aging affecting the i am slightly changing the the uh, the 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 pattern of discussion that uh, the aging definitely affects the clinical presentation of diabetes and uh, at this stage the diagnosis becomes problematic especially because physiology renal threshold for example 
is uh, such that these patients even in presence of very high hyperglycemia may not have glycosuria that is very important. Most of these patients may not have polydipsia which is usually a feature of diabetes. Dehydration due to altered thirst perception in because of mainly because of uh, the cognitive dysfunction in these age groups leads to dehydration and delayed supplementation they are physically is not so active to, to frequently procure themselves the fluid supplements. The, the common presenting symptoms in uh, these patients are therefore usually dry eyes, dryness in mouth, confusion, incontinence and complications relating to diabetes like neuropathy, nephropathy, retinopathy or macrovascular complications. So, but most importantly in these patients as we, we intend to um, bring in a tight control of uh, hyperglycemia, they very often land into hypoglycemia which is a great risk of treatment in these subjects. Uh, Dr. Sina, how is diabetes mellitus diagnosed in such cases that is in an elderly patient? Uh, criteria remains same and this criteria of diagnosis of diabetes mellitus which has been laid down by ADA American Diabetic Association and world over has been accepted that one of these three criteria should be there at least at two different occasions. Like if we test for plasma glucose in a fasting state, if the values are more than 126 milligram percent the first criteria or a random plasma glucose of more than 200 milligram percent in a patient who has got symptoms of diabetes unfortunately which is not uh, mostly seen in uh, elderly patients symptoms means here we commonly uh, uh, talk about polydipsia, polyphysia and polyuria and 2 hour oral glucose tolerance test with a glucose load of about 75 gram the blood sugar blood glucose level if it is more than 200 milligrams percent. So, any three of these criteria tested at two different occasions may suggest the, uh, the possibility of diabetes mellitus. How often do we uh, should we uh, in, uh, screen these patients? ADA recommends that all the elderly patients should be screened every year for the diabetes basically considering that they do not have classical symptoms and the symptoms may be very, very big. Uh, complications are very, very common in uh, diabetics, especially in the younger age group we know. Now, what about in the elderly age group? You're already they are having so many multi-system diseases. So, maybe their complications, are we able to pinpoint them specifically to diabetes or uh, uh, do they also become very vague? Well, complications are very, very vague as you rightly said Dr. Chika. And the most important complication of diabetes in elderly is the com cognitive complications which manifests as limitation in their activities of daily living, undiagnosed depression, dementia, various psychiatric illnesses. There is an evidence that if we treat these patients, if we manage their hyperglycemia and bring them to a very tight glucose control, these cognitive dysfunctions are improved drastically. There is a consistent improvement in these functions. So, besides cognitive dysfunction or cognitive complications, the standard microvascular complications are seen in these patients and like, like retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy you all know those uh, complications, microvascular complications. But important thing to remember here is that they are at present uh, even at the time of diagnosis in the cases in, in geriatric population, right. So, uh, which is usually a late observation in elderly in a young diabetics uh, even in type 2 diabetics, but they could be very very early in elderly type 2 diabetics. Unfortunately, a very tight con glucose control may not improve mortality because of these microvascular complications. So, that is why I as I said initially we may not in, uh, impress upon a very tight control of diabetes. Uh, 
especially if there is evidence of microvascular complications. Talking further about microvascular complications, diabetic retinopathy is an important uh, microvascular complication which is a common cause of blindness. Good that in this type of retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy can be brought under check if we can control the diabetes better you know. So, a good diabetic control can retard the onset of retinopathy. Cataract associated with diabetes is very, very common and occur at, at early age you know. So, the early you know that the cataract, a premature cataract is again a feature of diabetes you know. Patient therefore, should be referred every year for thorough eye examination that is one important message which should go. Diabetic nephropathy, the common cause of renal failure in geriatric population is diabetic nephropathy. Unlike glomerular nephritis which is the other common cause of nephro, uh, uh, the, the renal failure in younger patients. Significant improvements can be made independent of blood glucose control you know. You are aware that even once the patient develops diabetic nephropathy, if even by tight control of blood glucose levels, we may not achieve much in as regards renal failure outcome, you know. But other methods, other management methods like use of ACE inhibitors, a, a, dry, a significant management of blood pressure, especially trying to lower the blood pressure below 135 by 130 by 85 millimeter of mercury, they help much more than diabetes control in the management in the in the outcome of diabetic nephropathy. As regards neuropathy, neuropathy in elderly leads to gait imbalances and is a risk for uh, factor for falls you know. So, that has to be kept in mind. So, besides microvascular complications, Macrovascular diseases are also very common in diabetes in elderly. All microvascular complications you know of uh, cardiovascular diseases, cerebrovascular diseases, peripheral vascular diseases, they all lead to excess mortality in geriatric uh, diabetics you know elderly diabetics. I think that is a very, very long and exhaustive list about what are the complications that can occur in a geriatric yeah. patient. And uh, I think it is very important that we must know and we must also tell not only the elderly but also the caregivers that they must regularly uh, come in contact with the health facility or the doctors um, or the laboratory so that they are uh, continuously being assessed for development of their complications since that will also be an indication whether their diabetes is under control or not. So, it must be thoroughly investigated after regular intervals so that we can pick up any complications that may be starting to happen. Uh, I would now ask you to elaborate upon what medical therapies can be offered to such patients in the geriatric age group who are suffering from diabetes. Uh, well, yes, uh, before we, we talk about the medical therapies, one statement I would like to make. Medical therapy can contribute to the development of complications in older patients. One must keep it, this is this fact in mind before we institute the medical therapy. So, be careful before you institute any anti-diabetic measure you know. Of course, the following agents may require modifications like bigonites which are very frequently used in fact, a metformin which has been which has resurfaced as the most important anti-diabetic agent. Normally do not cause hypoglycemia, a major concern in elderly diabetics when used independently. It can however, it can definitely cause anorexia and weight loss. So, be careful in patients who already have anorexia and other bowel symptoms and they have a tendency of loose or thin built be careful in using metformin in these subjects. As regards sulfonylurea, the, the age old uh, anti-diabetic several generations we have now. Of course, the first generation, generation sulfonylurea which is still sometimes being used chlorpropamide the most common brand diabetes should be avoided because of their long half life. And if there is a long half life of any drug, there is always a propensity, increased propensity of hypoglycemia. So, that should be avoided. Thiogelidine dianons <laughs> basically are the most important anti-diabetic agent. Drugs like rosiglitazone, pioglitazones are usually not indicated in patients 
with evidence of heart failure or liver disease. So, in elderly patients who have any evidence of heart failure or liver failure, these groups of drugs should not be used. In rest of the patients who do not have any evidence of heart failure, this could be a very good drug for monotherapy as well. So, we can uh, definitely use these drugs safely in a large group of elderly diabetics. Alpha glucosidase inhibitors are uh, physiologically very important molecule you know which interferes with the enzymes in the intestine which are responsible for converting non absorbable dietary starch and sucrose into absorbable monosaccharides. So, physiologically this should be the very ideal agent you know in the management of uh, diabetes because this is going to prevent the conversion of a, a, solub a, a soluble form of absorbable form of uh, uh, a carbohydrate that is glucose. But uh, since this again has got lot of uh, um, side effects especially intestinal side effects where the patients feel bloating, uh, the, the continuous use of this agent becomes difficult. The most common molecule in this group a, a is acarbose which can be instituted in a dose of 25 milligram just with each meal you know we, we advocate that patient should uh, chew the, uh, the uh, acarbose tablet first and then start the, his uh, meal. Uh, uh, that can be stepped up to 50 milligram 3 times a day. The side effects like flatulence, intolerance are usually a, a, the, the limiting factor in the continuation of these diseases, the, these uh, agents. So, if patient can tolerate well, this could be a good agent especially for postprandial hyperglycemia, where with each meal the patient uh, gets hyperglycemia which otherwise cannot be easily managed by other oral agents. Megalitinides basically like repaglinides which is again a very good molecule is approved as a monotherapy or in combination with other drugs like metformin for type 2 diabetes. This agent is also good for a post prandial uh, hyperglycemia management. The, the advantage of using repaglinide is these being a very short acting drugs. So, one can titrate or one can take these uh, uh, drugs repaglinide based mainly at time of meal. So, especially in elderly patients who may not be having a very fixed schedule of mealing schedule in fact, they are benefited by such an agent that they can take these type, uh, drugs as and when they, they go for their uh, meal you know. So, that is it is an important agent. Insulin obviously remains the, the core treatment of diabetes mellitus in patients who have especially micro or microvascular complications, especially microvascular complications. And besides those patients who are unable to be managed on oral anti diabetics or anti hypoglycemic agents basically. So, but the risk of hypoglycemia, especially severe form of hypoglycemia associated with insulin increases with the age. So, one has to keep this important fact in mind before starting insulin. Therefore, this initiation of insulin is very tricky, should be done with very care involving other, other uh, specialty people too uh, along with uh, you know diabetologists. But how common do you feel Dr. Sina that the insulin needs to be uh, uh, given to these patients since they are all suffering mainly from type 2 diabetes. So, uh, you feel insulin has a role in such cases also? Yeah, definitely as I said initially that most of these patients geriatric diabetics are, di uh, are having underlying microvascular complication even at the time of diagnosis. So, is these patients are the ideal patients to be put on insulin therapy because most of these oral anti-diabetic agents will be contraindicated especially like renal failure the where metformin may not be useful, mm. the, the, the uh, these, uh, glitazons may not be uh, 
very useful. So, insulin at times becomes very important uh, modality for treatment of diabetes in elderly. With given care and caution, you know, insulin can be safely used in these patients. And uh, as you said in the beginning, that healthcare providers, doctors, all of them should be watchful, and especially if a patient has been put on insulin therapy. And you also mentioned that uh, with insulin, there is always a risk of hypoglycemia. There are many factors which can predispose an elderly to hypoglycemia. W would you like to elaborate on these factors yes. which predispose? Uh, yes, rightly said. There are several factors which can predispose my hypoglycemia. So, in geriatric patients especially, you know, like poor or erratic nutritional intake, we all know the reasons. They are mostly sedentary and, uh, and uh, their meal is usually erratic, both co composition wise as well as time wise, you know, as and when they will they take their meal. The, the other important factor is changes in their mental status that impair the perception of uh, developing hypoglycemia. Normal uh, mental status people will identify hypoglycemia very quickly because those symptoms are like anxiety, palpitation, tremulousness, confusion. They, they, these are very important say, early, early uh, hypoglycemic symptoms which may not be very well appreciated by these geriatric uh, patients because of their changed mental status. Increased polypharmacy and non-compliance with medication is another important factor which leads to hypoglycemia in these patients basically. Dependence or isolation that limits receipt of early treatment for hypoglycemia is another important reason. So, they, these patients are often so much dependent on other people to provide them meal or even medications that hypoglycemia treatment which should be instituted very early in these patients are often delayed to such an extent that damage could be irreversible. Then impaired renal or hepatic metabolism is another important contributor for development of hypoglycemia in these patients. Presence of comorbid conditions, any other disease can cause hypoglycemia in these patients. So, these are some important factors which lead to uh, more often development of hypoglycemia in elderly patients. Uh, you have elaborated a lot on medical therapies, no doubt medical therapies are very important, but we know that diabetes is a lifestyle disease and uh, modification of the lifestyle uh, is very important. Uh, for uh, prevention, I think at this stage would be too late now, but at least for uh, avoiding the risks, the complications, the uh, uh, morbidity to reducing the morbidities, we can do a lot I think in uh, lifestyle management. What are the lifestyle management which we must tell our elderly patients so that they can modify their lifestyle and uh, lead a better life? Well, the lifestyle intervention mainly includes diet and exercise. And uh, they are, as you rightly said, are the cornerstone of diabetic treatment at all ages, may it be geriatric patients or, or any younger age group patients. Uh, well, although weight loss increases insulin sensitivity and has favorable effects on lipids as well, as well as blood pressure, dietary strategies and in even, even very low calorie diets are seldom effective in achieving long term weight reduction. I think we will be talking about diet portion in detail with Dr. Seema Puri. So, but uh, this one important fact one should keep in mind that even by inducing very low calorie diets, we rarely achieve the long term weight reduction. Uh, to briefly touch on dietary therapy, we can say that dietary therapy is, pro is a problem in itself because of various coexisting features. The special considerations in geriatric age group are the financial difficulty which these people face in maintaining a, a diet which is good enough for diabetes management in these patients, difficulty with shopping you know because of transportation or mobility problems another important factor, poor food preparation skills especially of if the person is elderly widowed man you know losing wife early in the life and not knowing how to cook their meal, you know. Difficulty following the dietary instructions because of impaired cognitive function do not understand. Decreased taste bud 
due to loss of uh, and leading to loss of taste. Increased frequency of constipation, problems with chewing because of loss of teeth. So, these are some very important factors which lead to difficulty in dietary management of these patients you know. However, we should attempt to have a total calories and its distribution to be as close as desired and should correspond to the standard that dietary therapy. As regards the exercise in these patients, geriatric diabetics, the exercise prescribed need not be intense to confer benefits you know, one has to be very moderate in exercise. Even moderate laser activities has been associated with a reduced risk of developing diabetes. So, a very aggressive exercise plan may not be very important uh, to manage to, to uh, manage diabetes in geriatric patients basically. I think uh, still whatever little can be done I think must be done so that uh, diabetes uh, does not become such a life uh, I mean it does not become a disability dis disabling condition. Uh, we have some conditions which are very closely associated with diabetes I think one of them is hypertension. So, how does hypertension uh, have a, a role I mean in uh, affecting diabetes? Well, hypertension the prevalence is very high in type 2 diabetics even in younger as well as elderly, but this rises from 40 percent at the age of 45 to around 60 percent by the age of 75 percent. So, a diabetics of around 75 age, 60 percent of them will be having hypertension and this is a factor that contributes significantly to both macrovascular as well as microvascular disease you know. In most cases therapy should be instituted if blood pressure exceeds 140-90 and the target blood pressure as I said earlier should be below 130 by 85 and as I said the, the uh, focus especially in diabetic nephropathy should be to, to lower the blood pressure as low as possible uh, by, by drugs like ACE inhibitors rather than bringing the, the uh, hyperglycemia to a very tight use glycemic levels. So, using ACE inhibitors and other antihypertensive uh, drugs the target of uh, blood pressure should be around less than 130 by 85 in diabetics having hypertension. Thank you Dr. Sinha, I think this was a very very uh, exhaustive presentation on diabetes. I would now request Dr. Seema Puri to discuss what are the, uh, what is the nutritional requirements or recommendations that we can give for as far as diet is concerned or nutrition is concerned for a diabetic patient. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Kubba, <coughs> as Dr. Sinha said diet is a very important aspect in the management of uh, diabetes and diet is uh, responsible in a very major way for good glycemic control. Um, of course, activity and diet both go hand in hand. Uh, in geriatric patients or people with uh, type 2 diabetes, we find that if their body weight is maintained at a little less than the ideal body weight, their glycemic control is better. And also, uh, it is seen that uh, uh, even li little weight loss brings about a greater glycemic control. So, it is important to monitor their weight and also most middle aged and elderly diabetics are often obese. So, we need to uh, reduce their body weight to uh, a normal level. Uh, some basic principles would involve a very uh, uh, a saying which goes which says avoid fasting and feasting. So, for a diabetic uh, like Dr. Sinha mentioned it is important to have regular meals not to skip meals, but not also binge or go on a feast or eat extra. So, they have to monitor their diet very carefully. And then of course, another thing I would just like to highlight is that uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, fads which go around, you know, di elderly population, they listen to their friends, their neighbors that this is a magic food. If you eat this, the blood sugar will go down and if this is done, uh, you eat this particular food or this herb it controls blood uh, glucose. There are very few things like that. So, they should not get blindly taken in and they should follow the doctor's advice. When it comes to the nutrient recommendations, uh, there are various steps to planning a diet for a diabetic. I will just highlight some of those. Uh, as you can see here, we the first important thing is to determine how much energy 
that needs to be given. Once we decide how much calories are to be provided in the diet, then we need to know how much carbohydrate, fat or protein uh, has to come in. And then of course, not only the proportion, but also what is the type of carbohydrate. Fiber is a very important uh, aspect. Also the type of food preparation, because this influences to a large extent, these three factors influence the glycemic index of foods and foods with low glycemic index are beneficial for diabetics. Glycemic index is a concept which says uh, it is the rate of elevation of blood glucose upon intake of a particular food. So, there are some foods where the elevation in blood glucose are very rapid like sugars or simple uh, carbohydrates while foods which are high in fiber would have a lower glycemic index and therefore they are beneficial. Uh, besides that we need to also then think of how to distribute the food in the whole day in the various meals that will depend upon the treatment the uh, whether it is oral hypoglycemic drugs or uh, the type of insulin which is being given and also the uh, stage of diabetes the prevalence of any complications as Dr. Sinha mentioned. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Puri what do you feel are the, how do we determine the energy requirements in an elderly when we are planning uh, the diet especially for diabetes then how do we determine uh, what how much energy will be required for that particular person? Well to determine the energy requirements you would first have to decide what their body weight should be what should their ideal body weight be. There are various tables which are available the life insurance tables and all which can be used but a very simple formula I have given you that for women if we take 5 feet to be 45.5 kgs and for every inch we add 2.3 kgs a very rough estimate for men we take 5 feet is 48 kgs and we add 2.7 kgs for every inch beyond that. Now once we decide what is the ideal body weight keeping the activity of the person in mind now most geriatric people are sedentary workers. So if the person is obese we would take 20 to 25 calories per kg ideal body weight per day if it's he's a normal person it's 30 if it's underweight it's 35 so i've given you this little table uh, which highlights the calorie intake which should be given now once we calculate the calorie intake like i mentioned earlier the next step is to divide the calories into carbohydrate fats and proteins uh, in this as you can see proteins should constitute 15 to 20 percent of the total energy so one way approximate way would be to do it is to take 1 gram per kg ideal body weight. So if a person is 50 kg, it is a 50 gram protein diet or to take 20, 15 to 20 percent of the energy. The carbohydrates should be 55 to 70 percent but again we have the limits. It should not be less than 100 grams and not more than 300 grams because this affects their uh, cognitive function if it is very low carbohydrate. And that is why as Dr. Sinha mentioned very low calorie diets are not beneficial. Then fat because most of them are also prone to uh, heart disease and hypertension. The fat should be 20 percent or less of the total energy and the type of fat is also important. So it should be a combination of polyunsaturated, saturated and monounsaturated fatty acids and cholesterol less than 300 milligrams. Now when you say uh, PUFA, MUFA and SFA. It sounds a little complicated but it basically means that the diet should be a mixed fat diet that means there is some oil being used, some little bit of butter being used, little bit of saturated fat like ghee or something being used and not just dependence on one type of oil. Also mustard oil and peanut oil or soya bean oil it could be a mixture of these oils. I think this is a very important point which must be noted because like uh, uh, most of the times we do recommend that since they are all having heart disease and uh, so many multiple uh, problems that we tell them no your ghee has to be completely stopped. So I think that is a very important thing that they must be given in fact you have said proportion of 1 is to 1 is to 1. So they must take a combination like they can have a butter toast in the morning they yes. can apply little butter and then maybe the, the uh, ghee that can be used for the tarka in the dal and or in the roti and of course the vegetable can be made in different types of oils as you have said. So that will help in balancing out the different types of fats that are uh, uh, to be recommended for this yes. age group. 
the only thing is very important to keep the quantity less. It doesn't okay. mean that if there is a permission to have ghee, uh, they <laughs> yeah, kind of that's uh, that's uh, have it uh, like that. And then of course, uh, very important is that the alcohol content, if the person is consuming alcohol, that must be accounted for in the energy. And as a, you can see in the slide, about one peg of alcohol gives you about 70 kilocalories and beer is about 20 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per litre. So this must be accounted for in the total calories which have been planned for this uh, patient. Now what are the types of carbohydrate that we normally I mean recommend for such kinds of patients that uh, are, as you said that you know they should have a uh, low high uh, low glycemic index uh, yes, isn't yes. it. So uh, then what are the types of carbohydrates that you suggest should be used in such cases. Yeah, that's very important because uh, one thing of course we all know, even a lay person knows that simple sugars have to be uh, avoided completely and complex carbohydrates have to be preferred. The co carbohydrate like I told you is 55 to 70 percent of the total energy, but preferably from complex carbohydrates, fiber rich foods and uh, we also know that soluble fiber which is present in pulses in certain fruits and vegetables is beneficial in lowering the blood glucose val uh, levels. So the fiber rich foods, some of them are the various cereals like kutu, oats, ragi. So again the traditional concept of having a mixed cereal diet uh, holds good here and uh, the concept of even uh, you know three parts of wheat flour to one part of part of chane ka atta is also beneficial because the chana atta has a lot of soluble fiber. And therefore, this would lower the glycemic index of that food. And uh, when we talk of glycemic index, we find that foods which are raw, because they take longer to digest, they have a lower glycemic index. And therefore, the elevation in blood glucose is not as fast. And therefore, uh, we would pref prefer to give foods like uh, salads rather than a cooked vegetable. And then, of course, foods which are rich in amylose like Bengal gram chana, is again a low glycemic index food and that is a concept of mixing it with atta to make the chapatis. And then foods which are cooked by dry methods without the addition of water are also have a lower glycemic index. So things like roasting, like grilling, these are much better than boiling or pressure cooking or steaming. And of course foods which are cooked for a lesser period of time would also have a lower glycemic index. So, foods like uh, khichdi or dals which have been overcooked, their glycemic index drops. So, these are simple tips which we can tell our patients or their caregivers which would help in uh, moderating the type of carbohydrate which can be eaten. But not only the type of carbohydrate, but it is also important to regulate the distribution between the meals. Depending upon the treatment, we will uh, divide the total amount of carbohydrate which is eaten in the day into various meals. Approximately you can even divide the total quantity of food which is eaten, but if we can do the calculations for carbohydrate and recommend it, it, it works much better. So as you can see if the patient is not on insulin, only on diet or on oral hypoglycemic drugs, it is virtually uh, equal distribution between breakfast, lunch and dinner, one third, one third or one fifth, two fifth, two fifth. And as in India, we normally have something to have in the evening, a cup of tea and some snacks, then that uh, can be accommodated from the allowance at breakfast. Then depending on the action of insulin, whether, whether it is an immediate acting or an intermediate or a long acting or a combination, we can have different uh, distributions of carbohydrate. As you can see, it is short acting, it means a person is having a morning evening dose, it comes to an equal distribution in the day. Intermediate and long acting insulins and uh, it is very important in these cases that besides the distribution I have shown that at bedtime some small snack with carbohydrate should be given because the insulin action is continuing throughout the night. Otherwise uh, it often happens that the patient uh, suffers from hypoglycemia at night when uh, or early in the morning. So that is important. Yeah. Thank you uh, Dr. Puri, that was really uh, very nice and I think uh, we must also keep one very important thing in mind uh, that while we are 
keeping these basic principles we must also know the traditional uh, things that are being uh, looked after for example as you mentioned that we should take uh, the raw um, uh, vegetables and raw um, uh, salads but uh, we must also remember that uh, most of them do not have teeth at this age or they yes. have dentures problems so maybe you know what we could do maybe we could tell them to Great grate tip. them or we could tell them to chop them very fine and then take them with a spoon instead of uh, you know just picking up a carrot and eating it like that so these are the small modifications that we have to make according to the patients thank you very much dr sina for being with us and enlightening our students about thyroid and diabetes thank you, thank you.